Welcome to Educational Alpha. I'm Bill Kelly, CEO of Kaya and your host, bringing you on the ground conversations with business leaders, educators, and industry colleagues from around the globe. In this episode, Bill welcomes esteemed guest, Jane Buchan, a prominent advocate for diversity and a pioneer in the alternative finance space. They discuss the significance of diversification and demographic adaptation in risk management, the shift from traditional to decentralized finance, and the future trajectories within this field. Jane also shares her notable career experiences, such as co-founding PAMCO and her association with the Financial Data Professional Institute, lending her expertise to talk about operational efficiency, alpha generation, and the data science challenges in financial markets. Listen in. Jane Buchan, welcome to Educational Alpha. Thank you for having me, Bill. My pleasure. Long overdue, and I've said this, whether you want to own it or not, you've been an important mentor to me. We've known each other just about a decade, and you were the chair of the Kaya board when I first came in, and you were in a very different professional seat then versus now. But rather than have me go on about what you've meant to me in my career at Kaya, maybe we can predate my arrival at Kaya, which was circa 2014, and talk a little bit about the evolution of your career, and then we could talk about it through the Kaya lens and what you're doing now. Yes. So I essentially grew up in the alternative space, mostly the liquid alternative space, after having started frankly, as a programmer and in traditional asset management, I morphed into this space. And I loved it because, and still love it, because it's innovative. It's where you find some of the brightest investment management talent, though there are some good people on the traditional side. But it's challenging. It's new markets, it's new instruments, it's new strategies. It's thinking about ways to improve the investment outcomes for investors and thinking about new things they can do that they can use to tailor their risk return trade off. So that's what I did. And as you know, I ended up co-founding along with three other people, PAMCO, Pacific Alternative Asset Management Company in 2000. We were put into business by several very large, I would call them Fortune 20, Fortune 30 pension plans. And we grew it to be the third largest fund of hedge funds in the world when I retired. And we served very, very large clients around the globe with nine offices and all sorts of different geographies. And I'm particularly proud of the record we produced, both in terms of being a steward for assets, but also all the people that we hired and the good investment returns we did. And maybe take one step back before we go forward. You and I have discussed this briefly, but I've seen in your bio as well that you and I share something else in common, which is high jumping. I was never Olympic bound. Perhaps you were much more close to that than I was. But you started out as a student athlete at Yale. And I don't know if pursuing that was ever in the calculus of Jane Buchan, but maybe talk a little bit about that, because I think that's an interesting hack about your background that might be worth exploring. Yes, I was a high jumper, and it's the reason I got into alternative investments, actually. So to make a long story short, I grew up in the great state of Oregon, which is one of the global homes of track and field, and so everybody did track and field. But I was still growing when I went to college, so frankly, the big schools weren't that interested in me. And I went back to the Ivy League primarily as a scholar, you know, to be a student, But over the course of my undergraduate career, I stopped growing and I got strong and I ended up doing very, very well in track and field. I was, I think, eight times Ivy League champion, both indoors and outdoors every season in the high jump. And then after I graduated, I got an offer eight months after graduation to jump for Nike Coast. And one of the places I was offered to go train and move was in Southern California. And it was my boss at JP Morgan who said, now that you've learned a lot of the basics because he trained us very, very well, he said, he put me with a firm that did a lot of innovative stuff. And the plan was to go back to Morgan, but I never made it back. Once I saw the California sun and the West coast, I stayed and I stayed in the alternative space. And that's how I learned about it. 
and what are other important pieces we move forward? It's interesting that you started out as a programmer, focusing on computer science, and that was long before Chat GPT. It was long before what TradFi to DeFi might mean. And I don't know if it was foresight on your side, but of the many things you thought about in terms of your programming skills, where did you expect to bring that versus where you actually did bring it, which we know how that story unfolds? Bill, you put too much foresight into me. I'm a person who lived in the moment. In fact, one of my more memorable stories that people love to kid me about is when I was at the university, I ended up with a pretty prominent, a very prominent finance person, professor as my advisor. He agreed to advise me because I was interested in doing some statistical work. And he asked if I wanted to go into finance. And I said, finance? No, how horrible. And I proceeded to explain to him about all the evils, in my opinion, of investment bankers. And I still remember him saying, actually putting his book down on his desk and saying very nicely, Jane, there are a few other jobs in finance. So I'd never even heard of asset management until I was halfway through my senior year in college. So I came to it from, I was interested in problems, interested in solving problems. Even in history classes, I would go back and recompute statistics about birth and death records. And I just have always been a really, really curious person. And so that's how I came to it. And I came to programming very early on. I was very lucky to grow up with the PC movement and actually started learning Fortran on a mainframe with computer cards. So I date myself going all the way back. But it was a way to get answers to my questions. It was a way to do things. It wasn't like I wanted to be a technologist. Or I, I didn't really think about careers in that sense. I was enjoying my classes. I enjoyed pulling things apart, solving problems. And that's what led me to finance, because what's great about finance, and as you know, I briefly was an academic for three years. I was a tenure track professor up at Tuck at the business school, is that even compared to academics, when you're working in the industry, you have all this data. You're at the leading edge. And more importantly, when you have hypotheses, you can try them out, either on paper or in some cases with actual dollars. And that sense of discovery and exploration is what totally excites me. So I want to come back to data in a moment through a 2023 lens, because I think it's very different now than it was back then. But I know I'm skipping over a few chapters, but what year did you start PAMCO? We started in 2000. So 20 some odd years ago. I always have had a thesis, Jane, and you've been around a long time. I think back when you started PAMCO, you could make a difference finding and sourcing alpha in the alternative space. Dispersion of results was not as wide. The median returns were less correlated with the public proxies. But then things accelerated, and the private equity space was even somewhat nascent in 2000. And even the hedge funds were just getting started back then. And I think Amo, one of our founders, is only a handful of years old. And as you look at the migration of aggression through the 2010s and now the 2020s, we are seeing much greater dispersion, higher correlation. And it's interesting, and maybe part of your foresight right before COVID, well, you had sold PAMCO to KKR Prisma. And then you started an all beta shop called Martlet, which, again, my interpretation, not putting words in your mouth, that is trying to access uncorrelated beta, the name of the game, and alpha is more the icing on the cake. So maybe talk about what the alt space looked like circa 2000 and starting PAMCO and where you think we are today and, and how investors should be taking this into their mindset as they think about greater diversification. So when I did my dissertation, stepping back a bit in the 90s, one of the things I wrote about was pricing convertible bonds. It's actually a mathematically complex problem because you don't know when you're going to exercise that convertible bond. So I went and did some history search just because my dissertation advisor, my thesis advisor, was very respectful and taught us all to be very respectful of the people who came before. And did you know that Warren Buffett was arbitraging convertibles in the 50s? So... These things have been around for a long time. Obviously, they are new markets. You know, the distressed debt market didn't exist in the form it existed until the RTC came along in the early 90s. But 
people have been very creative and clever about figuring out ways to finance businesses and finding different ways then to provide that capital and to hedge the risks they don't want. And that's how I think about alternative assets is it's taking different risks in different areas. I think about investing in a business. Theoretically, you know, somebody sets up a business, a lemonade stand, you want to go invest in it. Well, you invest directly. That's just what private equity is. It's later on that we decided, I know decentralization is really important to you, and I think it's an important concept, but it's later on that we decided to decentralize it by actually creating these instruments called stocks that could trade and be very fungible. So the more it changes, the more it's the same. But I think what's interesting about it is the markets do develop and do evolve, and you find different strategies. And when we started in 2000, private equity was much more understood. You know, everyone had heard about barbarians at the gate. There had been quite a few movies, a.k.a. Gordon Gecko, Greed is Good. So that's what most people thought about. And hedge funds were relatively under the radar at that point. I put together a hedge fund database trying to list as many as I could around 1989, 1990, and I came up with about 400. And in retrospect, I probably had two-thirds of the universe that really took outside money at that point in time. And obviously today there are thousands and thousands, and it's become a multi-trillion dollar industry. But you also find new pockets. I mean, think about some of the interesting things people do today, you know, backing music royalties. Who would have said David Bowie would monetize, you know, his royalties. I mean, there's all sorts of interesting things. And that's what attracts me to alternatives is they're very, very interesting opportunities that come around. And I think that's what produces the alpha is because if your mode of investing is I want 20 years of history, I want very stable parameters, I want things that don't really change. I mean, for example, not much has changed with the U.S. equity market. Different industries dominate. But stocks are basically still stocks. But if you think about markets like loans, like leveraged loans, natural direct lending, they change dramatically. And I think that's what keeps alternatives at the front and forefront. And for those who want to invest a lot of time, energy and effort to understand them. And occasionally, you know, you do make mistakes when you're in alternatives as in any investment strategy, but you can find some really good returns. And I think what's also changed in the industry is that people understand it's not just about returns. I mean, if I went back and said, I don't care about risk, I don't care about how we think about things going put together, we put all of our money in Apple. I mean, why even hold the S&P 500 broadly? So I think alternatives are a really interesting diversifier, both in terms of the return series, but also diversifying your risk exposures. And as a follow-up, I'll ask you if this is a good or a bad thing. But circa 1995, I was one of seven founders of a firm called Boston Partners, and it grew to be a very successful venture. And we eventually sold it to Rubico in Rotterdam because we needed more global distribution. About five years later, you started PAMCO. And then if I look at those two data points in light of a recent report that came out from PwC, where they're saying one in six firms are going to be gone from the face of the earth in the next four to five years. And and it's clear that the barriers of entry have gone up and having risk management and a lot of things around just the core art and science of asset management have gotten a lot more complex. Could you start a Boston Partners or a PAMCO today? And the answer might be yes, but is it a lot more difficult? Had the barriers of entry gone up either in reality or in perception? Yeah. I mean, the answer is yes, barriers have gone up. I entered the industry in the early 80s, mid to early 80s. And what you saw there was the start of the boutique movement. And now what we saw maybe about 10 years ago starting is what I call the end of the boutique movement. But you've had other boutique movements. If you go back and read history in the 60s and 70s, they had boutiques as well as asset management expands. And then it goes back to sort of the banking trust departments and the large banks. So, I mean, one of the things about asset management that's interesting to me is that there's never one model and this is the model forever. It changes based on the opportunity set. And I think one of the keys is what matters in an asset management organization are two things, basically the people 
you know, the people, how they work together, how they decide to do things, and then the data with systems. And essentially, you know, if you took a group of people and you provided the data and the systems, you can create an asset manager. And so from that view, if I put my former academic hat on, it really looks like what we would in academia call perfect firm, very low barrier to entry. And just as you say, this is the end of it. You still see some firms, some small firms growing very, very large and rapidly. So it depends. But right now, the market is in a place where bigger firms attract capital more easily and are better resourced today. And whether or not that is a good or a bad thing, we don't have to talk about any one firm in particular, but I do worry about asset gathering, which the large firms do very well, versus value creation, which might be the home of more the emerging and the midsize manager. But I may have used this reference on this podcast before, Jane, but Ashby Monk once said, and maybe recently, that the only way you get fired from a sovereign wealth fund is by innovating. So the risk of hiring that emerging manager, taking a chance on that small or medium-sized market manager is far greater than one of the big buyout firms. But with one of the big buyout firms, you may end up with more expensive beta as opposed to having to do a lot more work and maybe take country risk and really trying to source the alpha maybe in a market like India, as an example. So is size, does it correlate to alpha? I'm not certain size correlates to alpha, to be candid, because one of the things I'm seeing today is with a strong preference by a lot of institutional investors for the very, very large firm, I'm finding some very great small firms who want to constrain the amount of capital they invest in or with. And what they're able to do with that is they're able to produce some really, really good returns. And the reason is, is that there's a lot of, frankly, nooks and crannies where one can create some tremendous alpha. You just can't do it with a $10 billion or $50 billion asset base. And so, you know, I think that's what really matters is to think about things and be more open to it. I mean, if there's one thing that I would encourage people to do today is to be more open to smaller managers. It's sort of like when the world is fixated about big managers going the other direction is where you may find some opportunities. Yeah, I, I think that's all true. And and maybe moving toward, to use a Shakespearean reference, our career is maybe a five-act play. I, maybe I'm on act six, but you have a couple left in you. But I think the current Jane Buchan act has a couple of different scenes to it. One, you've been a tremendous champion of diversity, especially around gender. And I remember early in my tenure with 100 Women in Finance, it was 100 Women in Hedge Funds and Girls Who Invest. And I remember you're so candid and honest about this. I remember in one of the Kai board meetings, somebody asked you, Jane, how did you get that board seat? And you said they needed a girl. And I think you said it in a funny, dismissive way. But I think you, first and foremost, have been a very successful, accomplished professional who happens to be a woman. But I think you've taken nothing for granted in trying to champion that next piece. So that's one data point that you're focused on. The other one is this conversion from TradFi to DeFi. So maybe take your commitment and your passion into greater diversity, focusing maybe across the board, but maybe a bit on gender, given some of the causes you've supported, and then we can finish up with TradFi to DeFi. Yeah, one of the things I'm really proud of, and I think this comes from the fact that all four founding partners at PAMCO had PhDs. And I think many people looking back on it thought, oh, well, you're stronger researchers. And granted, we had very good research training, but there are a lot of really strong researchers that I admire in the industry who don't have PhDs. And frankly, there's some with PhDs who do pretty shoddy work. So I think that's important. But I think the big advantage of having the four PhDs is that the academy is more open to different people. You know, walk down the hallway. You know, I got my degree at Harvard as some of the world's top macroeconomists. Walk down the hallway and see who's not fighting with whom. That happens all the time. There isn't a sort of Harvard macroeconomics school. And you tend to find that in a lot of the top departments, even at places like Chicago. And I think because of that, they're very open to differing. It's the currency, having different perspectives. And frankly, you get kudos for commenting on things that other people miss. I mean, that's the whole publish or perish 
paradigm that's so important there. And so I think what that meant is that when the four of us founded PAMCO, we were much more open to people coming in with very different views. And in fact, one of the things I've fought very hard against are people that like to talk about their firm culture. I don't mind if they talk about firm culture, if it means ethics, if it means doing right things. What I do object to is when they're all thinking the same way. Because this is a very humbling business for all of us. Everyone I know has made you know mistakes over time. And what happens is, you know, the markets tell you whether you're right or wrong. And just when you think you have it understood, they'll give you a left turn. And so it's really important internally. And the best firms I've always seen internally are the ones that don't stifle dissent and actually reward people who look at things the different ways because you want to stress test everything. The market's going to tell you whether you're right or wrong. And you really robust risk management involves people around the room saying different things. And that's so critical and so important. And I think that gets lost. I also think when you happen to be in many cases, again, just speaking in generalities, like for example, in general, girls are shorter than boys, but I'm taller than a lot of guys. So, you know, you have to take generalities very loosely. But in generalities, when you see people who come from a traditional backgrounds and whether that's more working class background or maybe you're a person of color or maybe you're a female or other gender issues, I think people who advance to that mid level tend to be more comfortable saying things differently. They sort of celebrated their differences. And I think that's why we became such a great home. I mean, we didn't purposely try to hire a lot of women and people of color and working class people. It just felt that way. And two of my partners at one point were people who didn't even have college degrees. Now, granted, one of them went to Penn and left for the Solomon Brothers training program, you know, sort of a technical, did not finish. But I can remember having a conversation with a very large pension plan and saying this gentleman's very well known in the industry. He's a very high profile. Would you hire him even though he never finished his college degree? And they'd say, no, we couldn't do that. And I just think I'm much more interested in what people can do and how they think than what's on a resume. No, I, I think it's a great summary. And I think we maybe some of the importance of the narrative gets lost around diversification for the sake of diversification and diversity for the sake of diversity, but they're one and the same. And if you think about concentration of risk, it's found by like-minded thinking, doing the same thing at the same time. And we're at a place where uh, inputs are changing very, very rapidly. Demographics are changing very rapidly. And making sure that you have a management team and a thought process is taking uncorrelated views in is critically important. So, and doing that naturally, as you said, is so very important. And maybe as just a segue, Jane, to maybe moving toward a wrap up, but some of the work you're doing now, you're working with us on our FDP Institute, Financial Data Professional Institute, and you've made a couple of very wise observations to us when I think you looked at what we were doing, which was trying to upskill and cross-skill the analyst that was working side by side with the data scientist. And and you're saying, hey, that's great maybe for asset management, but what about the broader industry of financial services, including insurance companies and mortgage underwriters? And then you further challenge our thinking about the size and the scale of the mid and back office, which has the greatest amount of diversity. So you have now a more diverse population that's already opted into this industry in a place in the value chain that is likely to see the most amount of disruption. So what do we do about that? We came forward with a micro-credential that is being beta tested by a couple of very large and sophisticated asset managers as we sit here today, and hopefully we'll have more to talk about in the days ahead. But Having gone through this program a little bit myself, it was interesting what I learned from it. And one of the most interesting data points is of late, late last year, early this year, the disparity between public and private marks has been topical. And yet our program covered this before it became a news headline. And you actually had a subject matter expert on there talking about a data-driven tool that he used at one of the most sophisticated endowments. So it was an interesting thought and early stages, but you can either comment on what we're doing there or more broadly, where you see this TradFi to DeFi play going. I think it's going in a lot of directions, but it ain't going away. 
Yeah, no, thank you, Bill. No, and I want to thank you and Kaya and the Financial Data Professional Institute for letting me get involved sort of as the pandemic hit, you know, what's there of interest to do. And I've always enjoyed explaining and opening up and asking questions and finding things for people. And one of the really interesting things to me, you know, when you manage a firm, you sit in that CEO seat. One of my partners said CEO stands for chief employee officer. And I really think that's true. But the second thing is you see the whole process. You see it not only from the idea generation, the portfolio management, which is the seats that I come from, but then you have to implement it and then you have to report it. And those really become very operational and those become huge competitive advantages. I mean, one of the things that we prided ourselves on at PAMCO was how that if people went out and hired the same list of fee managers, we'd still come in cheaper even with our fund of funds fee than if they'd hired them directly. And you do that by cutting costs and figuring out ways to get bulk purchasing and other issues. And so you have to understand the individual processes. And one of the big problems with data science is that in the financial markets is that, as you know, how much do the markets behave like they did before? We get big regime changes. We get things to change a lot. However, when you go and look at the operation side, those tend to be much more stable. And I think there's a tremendous amount of alpha. Just like at Panco, we produce tremendous operational alpha. I think there's tremendous alpha that can still be wrung out of the system on the mid and back office side. And I'm very excited about that because the market is getting more competitive. And so that will be really, really important as we go forward. So I'm going to leave it there, Jane, because I think that puts us in a very good place around a teaser for this product once we get it through the beta. And I'm very excited about what we're developing there. So thank you for joining me. And thank you for what you've done for me, for Kaya, for our members, for our industry, and countless investors out there. You've uh, you've had an excellent track record personally and professionally. And uh, as I said, from a Shakespearean standpoint, a couple acts left. So I'm very curious and interested to see where that takes us. So Jane, thank you. Thank you, Bill. It's been a pleasure. And you've been such an inspiration. And go Kaya. Thank you. Thank you for listening to Educational Alpha. I'm your host, Bill Kelly. Learn more about the Kaya Association and subscribe to the show at kaya.org. That's C-A-I-A.org. See you next time.